Good morning. So I was looking forward to see the faces of the brave souls who have braved the sudden cold for Vedanta. One of the qualifications for Vedanta is titiksha, where you put up with all that the world can throw at you, the troubles, the physical and mental troubles, and still you stick to Vedanta. Yes. So heat or cold, I will go and attend a Vedanta class. That is titiksha. That is the practice of spiritual fortitude. Today, I propose to dwell on one mantra from the Upanishads, from the largest of the Upanishads, the Brihadaranyak Upanishad. There is a mantra uh, towards the end of that Upanishad. It goes like this. Atmanam jedvijaniyad ayam asmiti purushaha kimichan kasya kamaya shariram manuswangjwaret. This particular mantra, I'll tell you what it means. It contains the essence of Vedanta. And uh, Shankaracharya in his commentary has written a brief commentary on it maybe a paragraph or so. But Vidyaranya, in his Panchadashi, uh, writes his biggest chapter, the seventh chapter, 290 verses on this one short uh, mantra. 290 verses. And that chapter is packed with a lot of insights into Vedanta, into spiritual life. So I'll primarily draw upon that and many other things today. A lot of material, a lot of ground to cover. Let's see. Uh, I'll have to move fast and you'll have to pay attention. Atmanam jayad vijaniyad ayamasmiti purushaha. That's the original language. What does it mean? When a person realizes the self, I, to be this, ayamasmi iti, this uh, sat chidananda, I am not the body and mind, I am existence consciousness bliss. When one realizes this, the next, kimichan, desiring what? Kasya kamaya, for whose satisfaction, for whose pleasure? Shariram anusangjwaret. Will such a person, such an enlightened person, suffer along with the body? Suffer along with the body and mind? Uh, continue to subject oneself to the sufferings of the body and mind. So the whole verse together means, when one becomes enlightened, by enlightenment in Vedanta, we realize that we are the absolute existence, consciousness, bliss. Not this body-mind. When actually one realizes it directly, then desiring what? What shall I desire? And for whose sake? Kimichan kasya kamaya. Shariram anusanjarit. Will one continue to suffer with the body-mind? Four aspects are to be understood here. Uh, one is realization. That I must, well, for the first aspect is jnana, realization. Who am I or what am I really? Number one. The second aspect is what is called um, negation of worldly enjoyment. Bhogya nisheda, kimichan. Desiring what? Then nothing in this world becomes an object that, that is worth pursuing. One transcends all of that. So the second point we, we have to we'll dwell upon is, what is to be desired in this world from the point of view of enlightenment? And the answer will be nothing, nothing worldly. No, none of the vishaya, the, the uh, sense objects are worthwhile. And the third point that we should note is, for whose sake am I doing all this? We never question this. So the enjoyer, the person who is trying, the, the entity which is trying to get pleasure and satisfaction and enjoyment in this world, we must inquire into that. For whose sake? Kasya kamaya. That's the third aspect. Uh, technically, it's a negation of the, of the individual enjoyer. In Sanskrit, your terms are very precise. Bhoktri nisheda. We think that we are an individual being in this body and mind and trying to attain certain goals in life. That one is dissolved. And then finally, 
suffering with the body mind complex that suffering is transcended we no longer suffer with the body mind complex the fourth fourth aspect this is called jivan mukti the body is still there it's still li living your life continues but in the midst of this this life we have transcended suffering so it, this is called jivan mukti living in the body and yet transcending the body so these are the aspects of this this uh, short mantra from the brihadaranyaka upanishad and i propose to dwell on this today with uh, the help of the material that i have mined from uh, vidyaranya in panchadashi he takes the help of that story i have told this often the tenth man story the spiritual journey to enlightenment he understands through the tenth man story the story in brief we all know ten friends were uh, going on a journey and then they had to cross a river and they crossed the river and when they went across suddenly docker to one of them did we all cross or did somebody drown let's count and one of them counts 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 9 no no that can't be right 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oh my god the 10th person is drowned is not here and the other ones say others say that no you are not counting right let me count and each of them counts and finds only 9 and we know why they are finding only 9 but they don't know they find only 9 and they think that the 10th person is drowned and they're crying and then somebody passes by a wise person who says why are you crying well the ten, our friend the 10th person is has drowned is dead how did you know we counted and of course this person must have counted and seen that there are 10 people and then this person says to them don't cry the 10th person is there alive where we don't see no just believe me there's an important stage in spiritual life just take it for, on on faith that the 10th person is there now i will show you when the person comes down it says count again 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 i told you there are 9 and this wise man takes this man's hand the one who was counting and turns it towards himself and says thou art the 10th dashamastomasi thou art the 10th and this man realizes that oh i am the 10th my god the 10th person has been found and so happy and delighted and others say let me try it let me try it and they also find 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 oh my god the 10th person is found and everybody is happy all right this is the story Now here if you look closely the seven stages of spiritual life according to Vedanta they are all there what are the seven stages agyana ignorance number 1 second is avarana veiling third bikshepa error and suffering fourth paroksha gyana indirect knowledge indirect knowledge fifth aparoksha gyana direct knowledge enli enlightenment Sixth, dukkha nivritti, transcendence of suffering. Seventh, ananda prapti or tripti prapti, attainment of bliss, the great bliss, which is the subject of this morning's talk. So seven stages. Let's look at the story. First of all, there is ignorance. The person doesn't know that he has to count himself. So that is the first, first the root of all of this ignorance. Uh, Vivekananda, when he came to this country, and uh, he said. In Vedanta, we do not talk about original sin. We talk about ignorance. We do not know our true nature. We do not know what is what, and therefore the problem starts. So, first, ignorance that I have to count myself. Somehow it slipped that that person's uh, attention. Ignorance, and the second problem comes from there is our and a veiling. Veiling is of the nature. I don't see the tenth person. It's veiled. Where is the tenth person? It, it's it's uh, hidden from me. This is the second stage and in the same way in our life atman god brahman uh, immortal soul i don't see it where the first person think that the skeptic or an atheist ask where is god i don't see god we are talking about pure consciousness uh, atman brahman where i see a body we look inside i see a mind that's it so it's veiled for us it's there just like the 10th person but veiled for us the thinnest of veils but very powerful nevertheless so the second stage in 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 our spiritual journey is our reality is veiled for us just like the 10th person he says 10th person is not there can i i can't see the 10th person i can't experience god or brahman or atman second third vikshepa error from this comes error what happened to the, in the story 10th person is drowned you see can't see the 10th person 
So the next immediate conclusion is 10th person is drowned. And sorrow and wailing, oh, our poor friend, how he drowned, and then what sufferings that person must have had while drowning, and we shall never see him again, and 10th person is drowned. Exactly like that, we, we end, fall into error. I, the, the so-called pure consciousness, Atman or Brahman, not seen, second stage. Third stage, I am the body-mind. Because what is seen? What is experienced? The body is experienced, the mind is experienced, and the world is experienced. And hence, I am the body-mind, I am this little individual uh, interacting with other little individuals in this world called Jiva. Jiva is an individual being, sentient being. I am interacting with them, trying to make the best of my life, trying to overcome suffering. Mm -hmm. From our childhood till now and till, till our death, the whole struggle is somehow to overcome suffering and try to find some kind of joy, peace, peace bliss, satisfaction. We engage in various projects for that. And so suffering. And that is the third stage. Vikshepa. Error and suffering. In our case it is called samsara. Samsara. This whole project of living. You might say, no it's not all suffering. There is some fun in that also. I was reading George Orwell. He said, most of us we manage to have a fair bit of fun in our lives. But... On the whole, on the balance, life is suffering. Except for, he says, except for the very young or the very foolish. <laughs> on the balance, life is suffering, George Orwell says. And uh, uh, another person, uh, I forget, a writer here in the United States. He says, the uh, she, she writes, the statistics tell us um, one out of four persons in our country is suffering from some kind of mental um, illness. So if the three of your three best friends, uh, three of your best friends are all right, then it must be you. <laughs> <laughs> On the balance, George Orwell says, life is suffering. That is the third stage. We have this endless strife and striving and suffering. Then the fourth stage comes. The wise person comes and tells this, not, does not reveal the tenth person. First of all, what does the wise person say? Relax. Calm down. Believe me that the tenth person is there. Where? We don't see. Wait. I'll show you. But take it on faith. So, you, your, the guru comes along, the spiritual teacher comes along, the spiritual traditions of the book. You, you read the books of the different great spiritual traditions of humanity and you see that there is a possibility. There is a possibility of overcoming suffering. There is God or heaven or uh, uh, the Buddha will not talk about God and heaven, but the Buddha will say life is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. But the third noble truth, there is a, something beyond suffering. Nirvana. Something is there. Nirvana, moksha, salvation. Something is there beyond suffering. Where? I don't get it. Wait. Believe it. Accept it. Think about it now. Dwell with that for the time being. You'll get it. We'll, we'll show you directly. You will experience it directly. But for the time being, take it on faith. Why should I take it on faith? You take so many things on faith. When you go to the uh, classroom in Columbia University, um, maybe mathematics or, or, or physics or something, or computer science, you don't go in there th thinking that the professor must be lying to me. And the textbooks are full of lies. No. You take it on faith that I don't get it yet, I don't understand it yet, but if I persevere, I will understand. If I listen to this guy, uh, the teacher, or read these books, I will think about it, I will get it in time. So that kind of faith, that's all that that's we, we are asking for. Take it on faith that this possibility is there, the possibility of overcoming suffering is there. What stage was that? Stage four. This is called Paroksha Jnana. And the, the knowledge you get by reading a book, by listening to this talk in Vedanta society, okay, we have been told that I am the absolute uh, existence, consci consciousness, bliss. I don't even know if I can spell that properly, but I must be, he says so, so I guess it must be so. Um, one Swami in the Himalayas, so he was questioned, oh, why should we believe this? And he said, why do you believe that these are your parents, your, that's your mother? Well, 
there are records. The hospital record shows that. And he says, well, are the hospital records even better than the Upanishads and the Gita and, and uh, you know, all the great scriptures of humanity? He um, says, um, no, but the nurse saw this. The nurse saw that uh, my mother gave birth to me. And uh, the Swami said, it works very nicely in Hindi. Hum bol rahe hain, tum brahma ho. Hum kya nurse se bhi gai guj rahe hain? I am telling, so the nurse tells you that this is your mother. I am telling you that you are Brahman. Am I worse than the nurse? <laughs> am I less believable? So, take it on, uh, on, on um, faith that there is this reality. This is called Paroksha Jnana, which you get from a book, which you get from um, classes and from teachers and so on. From your spiritual tradition, religious tradition. And then comes the final realization, the fifth stage, where the teacher tells you, where the person turns his hand around and says, Thou art the tenth. And with a process, a spiritual process, in, in Vedanta we undergo various techniques. The method of the seer and the seen. We have often discussed this. Drik Drishya Viveka. The method of the five sheets. The method of the three states, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. By this analysis, by these kinds of philosophical analysis, we are made to appreciate Actually, I am the witness of the five sheets. I am not this body made of five sheets. I am the witness consciousness here. Or I am the witness of the waking and the dreaming and the deep sleep. I am the consciousness which illumines all of them. I am free of them. They come and go. Or I am the seer, the experiencer. Clearly, I am not the experienced object. So the body and the mind are all experienced. And therefore, I am the direct experiencer of this mind and body. And so on. And by this process, <clears throat> along with a lot of other spiritual practices, I don't get it. What are you saying? Oh, you don't get it? All right. In that case, sit straight. Breathe in this way. Meditate on Om in your heart. I'm f feeling sleepy if I try to do that. Okay, feeling sleepy. In that case, open your eyes. Don't close your eyes. Here is a uh, picture. Here is an icon. Here are flowers. Here is a mantra to be chanted. Chant it loudly so that you don't fall asleep. I find this boring. You find this boring? Then go out. Here are homeless people. You go and help them without taking anything in return for, the, uh, you know, for your services. Karma yoga, upasana, worship. Uh, bhakti yoga, meditation, raja yoga. All of these practices are important at this stage to convert this understanding into a direct realization. And then what, what happens in the fifth stage? Like the tenth person who realized one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh my God. In the same way, there's a flash. There's a breakthrough. There is a moment of overwhelming clarity. It comes. That, oh, I am free of this body and mind. I am the ever free witness consciousness. Satchidananda. Then what happens? Sixth stage. Sorrow goes away. The sorrow of the losing our friend, the tenth man, that goes away. How? I see that the problems are in the body mind. I, the witness consciousness, I am the witness of the suffering in the body. I am the witness of the suffering in the mind. Quite apart from the body mind. I never had any suffering. I do not have any suffering. There is no possibility of me having any suffering. So the question of removing suffering also goes away. I have been ever free. This becomes very clear. This is called Dukkha Nivritti. Transcending suffering. And then, what am I? Beyond suffering. This, the bliss that I am, Sat Chit Ananda, is ever revealed to me. And the great joy, I have found the 10th person. Oh my God, my, our dear friend 10th person has been found. That joy which everybody enjoyed, that great joy, not because you found the 10th person, but you realized that you are one with God, that your own divine nature, Satchidananda Atma is ever present, ever shining forth, ever revealed to you. That kind of joy comes. The, the enlightened person, in every tradition, one characteristic is, they're extraordinarily happy and satisfied, blissful. That's why it's called Brahmananda, the bliss of the infinite. In every tradition, it doesn't have to be the knowledge tradition of Advaita Vedanta. It could be a devotee, you know, someone like Mirabai or 
uh, Surdas, uh, uh, or uh, the, the devotees, in, uh, lovers of God in every tradition, say St. Francis of Assisi, they're full of joy, even in the midst of what we would consider suffering and deprivation. They're full of joy. Ananda Prapti, that's the seventh stage. So these are the seven stages of the spiritual journey, which you see illustrated by the story of the tenth person. You see, basically, what is this journey? If you see it from a Dvaitic standpoint, this journey is a discovery of what we truly are. A discovery of what we truly are. What am I really? Here are these three meanings of the word I. When I say clock, when I say a word clock, the word is clock and it refers to this object. When I say the word I, what does it refer to? Not this one. I mean the vertical eye. What does the word I refer to? Instinctively it refers to body and mind. If you say, if you say I, it without any hesitation goes, this is I. And if somebody catches hold of this and say, what is this? We say, this is, I, this is me. The I, what am I? This body. And what, uh, what is this body? It's me. Instinctively it, it goes, goes to this body mind. Now Vedanta says, there are three meanings of this word I. One meaning in which we use it. The ignorant, the, the persons who are not enlightened, they use it in this, this meaning. And two meanings in which the enlightened use it. So what is the meaning in which the ignorant, those who are not yet enlightened, those who are on the road to enlightenment, in what way do they use the word I? The I means, for, for most of us, according to Vedanta, it's a combination of Sakshi, the witness consciousness, and Chidabhasa, the reflected consciousness. Chit and Chidabhasa, pure consciousness and reflected consciousness. What do these terms mean? First of all, the reflected consciousness, what it means is, right now, we are sitting and listening. If I ask you, are you aware? You ask yourself, am I aware? And the answer will come from inside. Yes, I'm aware. It could be I'm aware of the Swami speaking, if you're paying attention. It could be I'm aware of uh, um, how long is this going to last uh, if you're not paying so much attention. It could be that I'm aware of my dream if you're completely out of it and sleeping. Uh, if you're dropping off to sleep, you are, you are in your dream world, but you are aware. That awareness is what is called reflected consciousness or reflected awareness. It's like, it's not the real awareness, it's not, not the real you. The reflected awareness is like, when you look at your face in the mirror, you see your face in the mirror. And supposing you've forgotten your original face and you think, that's who I am. That's not who you are. That's a reflection of your face. That's not the real face. That's a reflection in the mirror. That has really nothing to do with your face. But suppose I have forgotten my own face and I take the reflection to be my face. That's what has happened to us. We are really the witness consciousness. We don't understand that yet. We don't grasp that yet. But we see ourselves as the awareness we feel in the mind. Most grown-up, educated, sensitive people think of ourselves as the sentient being in this body-mind complex. Right now? Right now, check with your life. Vedanta works wonderfully if you check with your life right now. Right now, honestly, what do I think I am? I think I am this person and this aware, sentient being, this person in this body. A person embodied in a body. That's what I think I am. Swami Vivekananda said, sit quietly and say to yourself, I. And if any thought of body or mind comes to you, you are not enlightened yet. If the word I refers to the body and mind, see like the word clock refers to this clock. If the word I straight away naturally refers to body mind, then I am not enlightened yet. So for the, for the unenlightened, the word I refers to the consciousness in this mind. And this mind is, is directly connected to the body. So for, the, for those who are not yet enlightened, not yet free, not yet Buddhas, we think, naturally think we are this, this person, body-mind. So that's one meaning of the word I, the primary meaning. But the enlightened persons have two meanings for the word I, which is different from us. What they have been able to do is separate the witness consciousness from the reflected consciousness. For them also the mirror is there. What's the mirror? The mind. What's the face in the mirror? The reflected consciousness. 
What's the original phase? The witness consciousness, Sakshi. The enlightened person is clearly able to distinguish between reflected face, real face. Yes, I can do that. You can do that for a reflected face and real face. But the enlightened person can distinguish between witness consciousness and reflected consciousness. So reflected consciousness, the awareness which we have right now, which is enabling us to hear and talk, or not hear, as you will, and, and dream. Um, and the original consciousness, the, the witness consciousness, which is being reflected in the, uh, in the mirror of the mind. This clarity. We are aware of the mixture. They are able to, able to separate it. Sri Ramakrishna put it very, very, in his sweet metaphor. Sand and sugar are mixed. The ant can separate them. Water and milk are mixed. The swan can separate them. And the last one, in Bengali, Golmale malache, golti baddi malti lodde. I mean, it, no, the translation comes nowhere close to the punch of the original. It says, in chaos... There is truth. Leave the chaos behind and take the truth out of it. Very poor translation. Now, in this mixture of pure consciousness and reflected consciousness, the enlightened person is able to separate the two. If you ask Ramakrishna, who are you truly? And Ramakrishna will say, I am Satchidananda. I am existence consciousness place. And you, then you ask, so, do you live in a room in the temple garden of Dakshineshwar? He will say, yeah. How can pure consciousness live in a room in the temple garden of Dakshineshwar? Are you a priest of the Divine Mother Kali? He will say, yes. How can pure consciousness be a priest of Divine Mother Kali or anything else? And if you say that, do you have a beard? He will say, yes, I have a beard. How can pure consciousness have a beard? The enlightened person uses the word I in two senses. One clearly as the real Satchidananda, I am Brahman, where with full honesty and conviction he can claim, Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham. I am of the nature of bliss and consciousness. I am Shiva, I am Shiva. Can claim, honestly. Can also claim that I have a beard and I live in the temple garden of Dakshineshwar and I'm a priest of Kali. What is he talking about then? The reflected consciousness. The, the awareness in that particular body-mind. Clearly, I am not that. It's the face in the mirror. But I am also aware of that. These two are the senses in which an enlightened person uses the word I. Sometimes you catch them in the transition. When Sri Ramakrishna says, when you come here, bring something for this. Uh, this will be worshipped one day in, from, um, in, a, in households. You know, the picture of this, when you looked at this, this picture. Referring to the body-mind, we normally do not refer to ourselves as this. The unenlightened person will not, cannot honestly refer to oneself as this. Or always refer to oneself as I, the mixture of pure consciousness and, with, uh, and reflected consciousness. So the I has these three senses. Anyway, how do you re uh, to realize this? Atmanam ched vijaniyat. The Sanskrit word vijaniyat means to realize it. To know it. Uh, to know it with great clarity, vijaniyat. How do you do that? Vedanta says, you see, we always hear, shravana manana nididhyasana, hear these truths, think about them, meditate upon them. Here is an insight. I will share this quickly with you. When we study the Vedanta, this truth is told to us that you are the original consciousness, the witness consciousness. Where do we get it from? Just now we are studying what? A little from the Upanishads, yes. We are studying a mantra from the Upanishads. The source of spiritual knowledge is the Upanishads. Vedanta is based on the Upanishads. It's the experience of the sages which they have shared with us. That points out this reality to us. You require that person, wise person to point out, thou art the tenth. To clarify, to, to remove the error in the mind, somebody has to come and point it out and turn our hand this way. So who does that? The teacher and the text, they do it. Now the first problem with this is, the texts say many things. If you look at the text, uh, Upanishad will tell you the story of Nachiketa who went to Yama. Upanishads will tell you, uh, sometimes in dualistic language, two birds sitting on a tree. Dwa, Saparna, Sayuja, Sakha. Two birds. So dualistic, not non-dualistic. 
Upanishads will sometimes, the Gita tells you about what to eat and how much to sleep and how much to exercise. Yuktahara, Viharascha. So what is it all about? This entire body of literature and all these teachings, what's the point of it? Can you tell me straight away? The point of it. So the first problem is to know the point of all of this. That's why a systematic study is necessary. What is the point of it? The point of all of this is that thou art. You are Brahman. That's the point. All the other things, the stories, the practices and everything, they are all helpful. But that's not the, those are not the point of the entire Upanishads, Gita or Vedanta. The point is that you are Brahman. To get to this point is the first stage, Shravana. Shravana means hearing or systematic study. So in technical Vedantic language, the problem of ascertaining the meaning of Vedanta is called Pramana Asambhavana. Pramana means source of knowledge. Asambhavana means um, confusion or impossibility or, or contradiction in the source of knowledge. That is resolved by Shravana, systematic study and hearing. Stage one. Stage two. After this, after what? After understanding all of Vedanta is telling me I am Brahman. After understanding this, second problem comes. Technically, this is called Prameya Sambhavana. A confusion or a, or a doubt regarding the subject of knowledge. What are you studying? What is the subject? I am Brahman. That's the subject I'm studying. I have a doubt about this. What is the doubt? How can I be Brahman? I am this body. I am this mind. I was born in such and such place. And this is my life story. So this is called um, this impossibility about the subject. The subject being that I am Brahman. I don't feel I am Brahman. I am this person. So this is removed by so much of discussion in Vedanta. Many questions are raised. You are, you are asked to raise your questions. Answers are given. You argue it out till you come to clarity. What clarity? That the Upanishads tell me that I am Brahman, stage one. And stage two, now I get it. I get it. I'm clear about it now. I begin to see what they are talking about. I'm, begin I'm beginning to understand that. That clarity comes, this is the second stage, it's called manana. The problem is called prameya sambhavana. Prameya means the thing to be known. What is to be known? I am Brahman. Asambhavana, confusion regarding that, impossibility. I am not Brahman. That is clarified by the second stage, mananam, which is uh, through logic and argumentation, put forward every question that you have, any question that you have, and the answers are dealt with. Even after this, a problem remains. What, have, what has been achieved till now? Till now I have achieved, the texts tell me I am Brahman, and I understand that I am Brahman. I understand. Here, I understand. But what's the problem now? The problem now is, I understand something here, but the rest of it, they don't obey. <laughs> they go their own way. Jonathan Hyde here, uh, who is a well-known psychologist. He's written the book, The Happiness Hypothesis. Uh, he writes, he gives the example of the mahut, the one who controls the elephant, sitting on the elephant and the elephant itself. Now, the one who's sitting on the elephant, who controls the elephant, he can read a map and he can know I'm to go from here, point A to point B. Now, the elephant is not interested in your maps. The elephant can't read the map. The elephant will, go, will take you from point A to point B only if the elephant wants. But if the elephant wants to go and raid a, a, a somebody's uh, garden and eat the bananas, then it's too strong. You can't stop it. <laughs> no, no amount of... See, that's what happens. The intellect gets convinced. You know, all these barns and nobles you will see full of well, big shelves full of self-help books. How to uh, meditate, how to become thin, how to become uh, happy and how to focus, uh, how to manage your time and so many wonderful books. If you see those books, you will feel that uh, life can be transformed into something fantastic within a few days. In three days, or seven day course, or 21 day course to happiness. And then after some time, they don't work. <laughs> I bought so many books. They don't work. They all say nice things and uh, persuasive things. What has happened? The books speak to the intellect. 
The intellect is con convinced. The intellect is full of enthusiasm. Yes, I must get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and meditate and do yoga. Intellect is full of fire and enthusiasm. But next day in the morning, when it is cold, when it is in, in the 20s, uh, and it's really, really cold, and 4 a.m. the alarm goes off, the body says, I am the one who's going to get up and feel cold, not you. <laughs> Intellect said, but what about all the resolutions? What about all the, uh, all the decisions that I have to do this? Uh, the body says, those were your resolutions. <laughs> Did you ask me? I like sleeping. <laughs> I like remaining under covers. And who's stronger? Usually the body is stronger. It's like a committee where the intellect is one member, but the emotions are another member. The likes and dislikes are the, the past conditioning is another member. The physical body with its nervous system is another member of the committee. Those members did not sign on for your program of self <laughs> self-improvement. So what does the elephant respond to? The elephant, just think about it. What do the mouths do? They don't give inspiring talks to the elephant. They train the elephant. And training is basically repetition. Repetition, a program of training is given. So once I have understood this, once I have, I have um, grasped this particular truth that I am Brahman, then I have to dwell on it. I have to dwell on it. This dwelling on what you have understood from the texts, what you have clear about intellectually, this continuous dwelling on it and trying to bring it into life, taking it for a test drive, uh, trying to struggle to manifest it in life, this is called nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation. It can be done, sit quietly and feel that you are Brahman, what you have understood, feel it as a reality, but it also can be done in action. Every day we chant when, when we go when we eat here, Brahma Arpanam Brahma Vi Brahma Agnau Brahma Nautam Brahme Vatena Gantavyam Brahma Karma Samadhina. That's not a prayer for eating. That's a prayer for Nididhyasana, the the final stage of Vedantic practice, that where you see the instruments of action as Brahman, the um, you know the uh, like where you are eating the food itself is brahman the one who is eating is brahman the act of eating is brahman in fact in any action one who sees all the factors of action as brahman that one attains to brahman that is nididhyasana that's dwelling on that before that you must have understood vedanta and you, you must get clarity about vedanta then try to manifest it in everyday life the persons you interact with are Brahman. This person, this body and mind is Brahman. The consciousness with which I, I do this work is Brahman. The instruments of action are Brahman. All factors involved in my life are Brahman. Deal with it like that. Person who can rem hold on to this awareness, that person realizes. This practice, it's strenuous. Ah, supte, amrite, kalam, nayet, vedanta, chintaya. Till you fall asleep. And till you uh, die. Till that point, continue with Vedanta. Immerse yourself in Vedantic thought. First the thought. Then only practice. Immerse yourself in this clarity of understanding. Then it will automatically get expressed in action. Usually we put the cart before the horse. Swami, I understood, I listened to your talk, but it doesn't work in real life. What you're trying to do is, I think I'm body and mind, but I'll try to behave like I'm Brahman. No. First, you must be clear about how you are Brahman. Then only try to behave like you're Brahman uh, in, 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 this, in, in the world of action. So this is the um, vijaniyat, when you realize yourself. How do you realize? Shravana, manana, nididhyasana. This third Third part, Nididhyasana removes a problem, technical name, Viparita Bhavana. Viparita Bhavana means opposite tendency. Life after life, we have conditioned ourselves to behave as if we are this body-mind. So even when clarity comes into the mind that I am the witness consciousness, I tend to behave as a body-mind. That tendency has to be reversed by dwelling on it, Nididhyasana. Three problems, three practices. First problem, I do, this is pramana sambhavana. I don't know what the texts mean. So shravana, study and listen again and again and again till you get a clarity about the text, the teaching. 
Now you know what the teaching says. Second problem, that prameya asambhavana. I know the texts tell me I'm Brahman, but I don't get it. How am I Brahman? What is Brahman? And how am I Brahman? So that is resolved by mananam, the second practice. And third is, even after attaining clarity that I am Brahman, now I know that the Upanishads teach, I am Brahman, I am clear about it, I've got clarity that I am Brahman, but I can't put it into practice in life. My, the elephant still tends to go its own way. So, the training, the drilling into it, Vivekananda says, tell yourself again and again, I am that, till it tingles with every drop of your blood. That is Nididhyasana. That's the final stage, Viparita Bhavana. Opposite tendencies are erased by this understanding. Realization. This is realization. Vijaniya. Atmanam Ched Vijaniya. Then what comes? Kimichan. Desiring what? I'm not even halfway through my talk. and the Time is almost up. No, but we'll go on a little more. Kimichan. Desiring what? What do you desire in life? Power, sense pleasures, power, learning, um, status. What do we desire in life? Kimichan, desiring what do we lead our lives? Here, consider for a mo moment from the enlightened person's point of view, of course, but even now we can see all our efforts till now to overcome suffering and to be happy. What have they yielded at this moment? Some of us, the little children here, you've lived, lived 9 years or 10 years or 11 years. The senior citizens, I know Bill has lived 94 years. So till now, all our lives spent in this project, what do we have to show for it? Are we happy? Have we attained something permanent? The first, first great fault of all worldly pursuits, impermanence. It comes and goes. Flash in the pan. Any sense pleasure, for example, is very impermanent. And somebody said, cookie, chocolate chip cookie, or something like that, whatever, whatever you, you, you want to, your, your favorite food. Put it on your, say, uh, two seconds or tw uh, on the lips and 20 years on the hips, somebody said. <laughs> you have to work so hard at Pilates to get rid of that extra fat. But the pleasure you get out of it, few seconds only. So, impermanent. Every joy. Sense pleasures, very much impermanent. And then all other pleasures also. Even the things that we cultivate in art and science. After 10 years, 20 years, there are other people who exceed you. You yourself begin to lose those capacities. Whether it's music or art or writing or science. One mathematician told me at a university, that I feel so depressed at seeing my seniors. You're, we are so inspired by them. But mathematics, pure mathematics, is a young person's game. And um, these people who are our seniors in the 60s and 70s, they still think they can make, do cutting edge work because that's what they've been pursuing all their life. And they write, but we know that they're writing trash. But it's so sad. They're invested, totally invested in that. That's their source of happiness. It goes away, impermanent. The Buddha said, Anityam, Anityam, Sarva, Anityam. Impermanent, impermanent, all is impermanent. You say, yeah, we know that all is impermanent, but I'm born and I have to die. But in between I can have my fun. I have a lot of life, a lot of time, you know. And the Buddha says, Kshanikam, Kshanikam, Sarvam, Kshanikam. Not only impermanent, momentary. It doesn't last for very long also. It lasts just a moment. Because there are many moments one after another in a series. We think it lasts for a long time. They say, Alata Chakravat, like whirling a firebrand. It looks like a circle of fire. But it's just one dot moving very fast. In the same way, life is not only impermanent, but also momentary. Kshanikam. Not only momentary, he goes further. Shunyam, shunyam, sarvam, shunyam. Void, void. Empty, empty, all is empty. And finally, Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. Hence suffering. Because impermanent, momentary and empty. And therefore suffering. You say, oh boy, what a pessimist. 
impermanence uh, of all kinds of enjoyments. That's one great, great defect. Kimichan, what will you desire? Everything is impermanent. Bhartri Hari, he writes, everything was momentary. I am now old when I look back, when I look back upon my childhood, school and college and all of that, it seems to have passed in a moment. Just look back and see, just gone. When you were there, it seemed to be forever. When will I grow up? But now that you look back upon it, it's momentary. And he says, youth, in its vigor and, and desire to taste the world and enjoy life, momentary, it seems to have gone in a moment. And middle-aged, beset with so many cares, financial worries, family worries, and projects for life. Life is passing me by, I have to do this, I have to do that. Gone. In a moment, it's gone. He says, now I am old, I walk tottering on with, with the help of a stick, my hair is grey, my teeth have fallen out, and in front of me there is only death. So momentary, all of life has gone by that way. Shanikam, momentary. Impermanent. That's one great problem of any kind of worldly uh, acquisition. The next problem is even the pleasures are mixed with suffering. Even the pleasures are mixed with suffering. Whatever you want to get. Yeah. So much effort is required to get it. Imagine, I want to be a multimillionaire on Wall Street. Well, first you have to go to an Ivy League college and getting in there you need so many percentiles on your sat and so much of... A tremendous effort uh, to write your, what do you call it? The, the thesis, uh, the, why you should be admitted there. Why should we take? Yes, the essays. And so much, so much effort. When I hear about it, just hearing makes me tired. <laughs> and after you get your degree, you have to get to work. And somebody was telling me, my kid is working 100 hour weeks in an investment firm, earning a lot of money, but 100 hour weeks. If you put in a 100 hour week, 100 hour week, you'll be enlightened. Well, maybe two, 200 hour weeks. That kind of commitment will definitely give you God realization, enlightenment. You can become a Buddha with that kind of effort. Huh? Doctors also, yes, doctor. They're not, and sometimes housewives work 100 hour weeks also, but they're never appreciated. It's only the glamorous Wall Street brokers who are appreciated. No, but it's true. I've, I stayed in these two interesting places. Last year I was in Hollywood and now Manhattan close to Wall Street. Two kinds of places. There the goal is glamour and the movie industry and making it there. That takes a lot of talent and work. Very few people make it. Here is the goal is to be, go to Wall Street and become a multimillionaire, you know, in your stocks and shares and investment and so on. Be a financial wizard. That also takes a lot of hard work. A lot of effort is put into that. Dukkha, suffering and, and strife is put into all our acquisitions. It's surrounded by suffering. And the Buddhists say, they are masters at this, uh, they call it raining on your parade. That <laughs> Leading up to the pleasure is, acquisition of the pleasure is suffering. And when you acquire that pleasure, there is the suffering knowing that it will going to come to an end. It's going to go away. Not only go away, it will leave traces in my mind wanting more. That is suffering. When it goes away, it is suffering. And the, the, the traces it has left, the addiction for more and more and more, more variety, that is suffering. suffering pleasure is surrounded by suffering. And the thesis is, life is suffering and pleasure is disguised suffering. Is, is suffering in mufti. So, the second great problem with worldly pleasures is it's surrounded by suffering. Second. The third one is, it is unsat unsatisfying. It is deeply unsatisfying. As I said, all of us, we've been trying to be happy with all these projects in life. And how many of us cl can claim after 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of trying, at this moment, right now, sitting here, can I claim that I have achieved it? Nobody. But there is a class of people who can claim that. And that class is the people who are spiritual, who are, who are enlightened. They can claim satisfaction. And the great bliss which we are talking about, that's coming next. So, kimichan, desiring what? And the next, the fourth great, and the greatest of it, um, problem with worldly satisfaction is, Advaita Vedanta says, mithya. They are not real. They are not real. That's the deepest fault. In the Isha Upanishad, 
one of the greatest Upanishads. At the end, it says, you know, the famous uh, mantra, the first mantra, Ishavasyam idam sarvam yatkincha jagatyam jagat. Everything in the world is to be covered with God. Covered with God means you have to discover God in everything. Tena taktyaktena bhunjita. Live your life based on this renunciation. Holding on to God and renouncing the quest for worldly pleasures. Ma gridha kasya swidhanam. Do not covet anybody else's wealth. It's a literal translation. What it means is, all your joy should be in, in God or in spirituality, not in worldly pursuits. That's the first meaning, the first layer. The second layer of the meaning, do not covet any, any, anybody's wealth or any wealth. The second layer is, Shankaracharya comments, the deeper meaning is, what wealth is there to covet? What is there actually in the world to covet? Because it's not real. If there was something real apart from that Satchidan and the, the, the Absolute, then you could say, I want that. I want to add that to myself. But there is no such thing. Everything in the world is a manifestation of the same Brahman. Why is it that when you see things in, in, in a movie, um, I remember there was the first and the only three-dimensional movie I saw when I was a kid. It had come to the a cinema hall and you had to put on these glasses and you could see it in 3D. It was a, it was, now you could, looking back about it, it was a very, very silly movie, but they had some th these funny special effects where somebody has a plate of sweets, Indian sweets, laddu, mithai, mm -hmm. and suddenly the plate comes out of the screen and comes in front, hovers in front of your face. Now you don't, the kids had a great deal of fun trying to grab it, you know. You could see people in the uh, movie hall swinging their arms trying to grab it. But you know it's all in fun. You really are not trying to grab it, even if you are hungry, because you know it's not there. Though it's in front of you, it's hovering right before your nose, it's not there. Exactly in the same way, Vedanta says, all the so-called pleasures of the world, they are appearances in the one consciousness that you are. Just like a movie, no different. In fact, Vidyaranya suggests an interesting exercise. When you wake up, sometimes we wake up from our dreams and we have a vivid, though temporary, memory of our dreams. We just feel we are seeing that. When you wake up, he says, stop there. I found this exercise very good. Stop there. Sit quietly. Don't jump, jump out of bed. Sit quietly. Look at the world around you. That means your bedroom and whatever you see. Close your eyes. Imagine what you just saw. And imagine the dream that you saw just before that. A minute before that, in your mind, the world that you see by opening your eyes and the world that you see in your dreams, if you compare the two, you will see how alike they are. There are things and people and colors and sounds and experiences there, experiences here. That's all that there is to it. If you open your eyes, the sense impressions are so vivid, they will make you feel this world is real. That was a dream. But if you see this and then close, like taking a picture, and then close your eyes and imagine what you saw, and then remember what you saw in the dream and bring them close together, you will see how dreamlike this worldly experience is. Right after a vivid dream. It's a very powerful technique. I found it useful. The Holy Mother said once to Swami Arupananda, my child, this world is also a dream. And he protested. He said, no, no, this is stable. Every night we go into a different dream. But we wake up into the same world. So this can't be a dream. She didn't give any Vedantic talk or argument. She just laughed. She said, even so, my child, this is nothing more than a dream. This waking world. So the fourth great problem with worldly desires is that it is dream like mithya, an appearance, a fa false. It's not a reality. It's an appearance and arising within our awareness, just like watching a movie. So fourth, what were the first three? <laughs> Somebody has screwed up the face trying to remember. He told us the first three. What were the three problems with worldly uh, enjoyment? One is temporary. Yes, it's temporary. The second one is it's uh, temporary and momentary are the same thing. The first one. It, it is, it is um, anityam. The second one is suffering. It is pervaded all through by suffering. It's mixed. It's like a sweet, your favorite cookie, but mixed with poison. Even a little bit of poison. 
that spoils the fun for the whole thing. And the third problem is that unsatisfactory. Nothing yet. We haven't learned our lesson. We keep pursuing the same thing. Somebody said the definition of insanity is if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results. That's the very definition of insanity. <laughs> so we keep doing that, trying to get happiness from this, this, these pursuits. And the last one, the greatest defect, but it's a very metaphysical and philosophical defect, that it's an appearance, it's false, it's not real out there. It's like trying to grab something from a movie and enjoy it. It's not there. Kimichan. And then even more, kasya kamaya. For whose sake? For whose sake are you doing this? I will not go into the depth of this discussion. There's a long discussion on this, but I'll briefly touch upon it. All the pleasures of the waking world, all that you enjoy and suffer in the dream world, and the peace and restfulness of the deep sleep, they remain where they are. You move smoothly between them. Waking, you understand what I'm referring to? Waking, dream, deep sleep. We move smoothly between these three states. When you move from waking, this waking world, Manhattan, your job, your apartment, your um, um, relatives, children and uh, spouse and community, your, your dog, and all of it is left behind, including your body, is left out of your consciousness and you may go into a dream world with its pleasures and its terrors. And when you f move out of the dream and fall into a deep slumber, all the, the nice dreams and the nightmares are left there. You move away from them into deep nothingness, a blankness, peacefulness. Enjoyments of the external world, enjoyments of the dream world, and the peace and, they say, Ananda Bhuk, the enjoyment of the restfulness of the deep sleep. All of them remain in waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. You move easily between them. The um, Upanishad gives the example of Mahamatsya, the great fish. On the two banks of the river Ganges, there's a great fish which goes sometimes on the left bank and sometimes on the right bank. It moves easily between them or sometimes in between, underneath the water. That's the way we move easily and freely between waking world, dream world and deep sleep world. Actually, I've seen this. In our monastery near Calcutta, the river Ganges is there, the Ganga. And there are, uh, there are river dolphins. River dolphins. The, the Ganges dolphin is there. And that sometimes, it sometimes comes up for air. So sometimes you see it coming up for air on the other side, on, on near Calcutta. Sometimes on this side near Belur. Sometimes in the middle of the river. Maybe the rishis saw this thing and they <laughs> gave this example. We move like that. Freely between all of these states. Therefore, we are free of these enjoyments and sufferings. For whose sake? The enjoyer in the waking state, Mr. So-and-so or Swami So-and-so, is left behind when you, the witness consciousness, transit into the deep sleep. Actually, you don't transit. Those states transit in front of you. They arise in front of you. And you, the sufferer or the enjoyer in the nightmares or the pleasant dreams of the dream state, that one is left behind. And you, the witness consciousness, now you experience the blankness and restfulness of deep sleep, which is left behind when again the waking state comes back. The bhokta and bhogya, the enjoyer or sufferer, and the objects of enjoyment or suffering, they are separate from you. For whose sake are you chasing those particular pleasures? For the waker, for the dreamer, for the deep sleeper, none of them are you. You are ap apart from all of them. I'll just say this. There's a whole discussion on how to attain this. Kasya kamaya, for whose sake? Then, shariram manusangjoret. The enlightened one, once you realize this, why should I suffer along with the body? Why should I identify myself with the body and mind suffer along with it? See, the body, three bodies, according to Vedanta. Physical body? He said, no, I have only one body, this one. But if you look closely, this body has three aspects. One is the physical body, which is public, which the doctor can examine. That's the physical body. Stula, Sharira, gross body. 
then subtle body, when you look inside, thoughts, feelings, memories, ideas, the person inside. Subtle body, sukshma sharira. And beyond that, it might seem theoretical, but we experience it. And for the sake of completion, we must account for it. The deep sleep experience, where we do not experience a physical body, we do not experience thoughts and memories. That deep sleep experience, that is caused by the causal body. They call it karana sharira. Stula sharira, physical body. Sukshma sharira, subtle body. And karana sharira, causal body. It is the causal body and the subtle body which go away after death. When the physical body dies. It's the causal body and the subtle body which we identify as the person. The, the individual person. So, each of them have sufferings. Oh, there is pain here or I am I'm, I'm so obese, I have to lose weight. I don't look like the way I look. I means they are the physical body. You are not that. Yes, you can take steps and enroll and, and, and in a gym to lose weight. But remember, the problem, of, the problem is in the physical body and is solved at the level of the physical body. You have nothing to do with it. Uh, experiencing it does not make, make you the possessor of something. When I experience a table, I don't become a table. I mean, I experience the cream or the yellow or the grey or something, I don't become cream or yellow or grey. Similarly, experiencing a body and its troubles does not make me the possessor of those troubles. That's the insight. Similarly, come to the subtle body. Desire, humiliation, anger, misery, depression, all the problems, not denying it. They are there, but they are there in the subtle body. You are the experiencer, the illuminator of all of that. Experiencing the misery of the subtle body, correct. Vedanta does not say that's wrong. But from there, when you jump to say, I am miserable, oh, I am so unhappy, Vedanta says wrong. You are the experience of the witness of the unhappiness in the mind. You are not unhappy. Think about that. In fact, when you do think about it, the unhappiness or the depression of the mind goes down. I could go on actually. I'm going to take one more hour, I think. Don't, don't worry, I won't. <laughs> so, the problem of the subtle body remains in the subtle body. And the deep sleep, you'll say, deep sleep, there is no problem. The sick person is not sick in deep sleep. The miserable person is not miserable in deep sleep because we do not experience the sick body or the miserable mind in deep sleep. True, but all the seeds are there. They say, Bijavastha in, in, in Mandukya Upanishad, that the, uh, the, the seed of all sufferings in waking and dreaming are there. Because when you wake up from deep sleep, you're still the same person. With the same limitations and desires and problems. So that means in deep sleep, when I was not aware of the problems, the problems were still there in seed state. So deep sleep, the causal body has the problem of having everything in a potential seed state. None of them I am, though I experience all of them. I am free of all of them. They come and go in me, the unchanging awareness. This is called Shariram Anusangjaret. For what should I suffer with the three bodies and the threefold problems? I am I am the witness free of all of them. Moment I realize this, I transcend suffering. This is the sixth stage. That dukkha nivritti, transcending suffering. I realize that I always was beyond suffering. It is uh, for it's out of my own foolishness that I was hugging the physical body. I was hugging the subtle body. I was hugging the causal body and bringing their suffering unto me. This hugging it, in Sanskrit, in, in philosophy it is called adhyasa, superimposition. I'm superimposing the whole deal upon me and my qualities of existence and reality upon them. So, why should I suffer along with them? The moment I'm free of this, simultaneously, the freedom and the joy of my own nature, ananda swarupa, becomes revealed to me. The great satisfaction, what I meant, the great bliss, the subject which we have today. We have just started the subject now, the great bliss. Now we are beginning to understand what the great bliss is. Once you reach that, why, ask yourself, why is the enlightened person so happy? Why are 
spiritually advanced people so happy. They're happy because they have the experience that my Brahman nature is ever revealed to me. Brahmanandam spashtam vibhati me. The bliss of Brahman is, is spectacularly, clearly ever shining before me. Why should I not be happy? Compared to that person, there's a song which says, the people of the world sitting on the banks of an ocean of nectar, they die of thirst. What are they doing? Sitting on the bank, the poet said, I think it's, no, Rajini Kant or something, I think. He says he's sitting on the bank of the river, or Atul Prasad, sitting on the bank of the river of nectar, it's flowing past, but does not look there. He's digging in the sand for a, hope, hoping a little bit of water. Digging in the dry sand, hoping for a little bit of water to slake this unquenchable thirst which we experience in the world all throughout our lives. While the river, the ocean of nectar flows past silently within us. All you have to do is turn. Turn inwards. It's there. Vedanta clearly takes you there by the hand, step by step, baby step by baby step and shows you that. Ananda Prapti. Now what is the cause of this bliss? Vedanta says three things. Kritakrityataya, Prapaniya Praptataya and Gyatavya Gyatataya. What does that mean? You finally realize at that point that you have done what is to be done in human life. That attainment of that comp the ultimate peace and bliss and satisfaction, you've got it. You have done it. You have, you have realized God, you have found God, you have found your true self. Imagine, if you are no longer haunted by a sense of, why did I not do these things? A nurse who was in term who taking care of terminally ill patients, she talked with them and she has written down her uh, recollections. Very interesting. She said the greatest regret that dying people had, the greatest regret, was that they never tried to do the things they really wanted in their lives. Now life is gone. They always, always had a dream of doing something or the other which they could not get around to for some reason. They never even, not even that they did not do it, that they did not try. That is the greatest regret at the point of death. Imagine then fear, knowing that you have done it all. There is nothing that remains for you to be done in, in life. So, Kritakrityataya, it is accomplished, it's done. Imagine the peace. Second, Prapaniya Praptam, that which is to be attained in life, what is to be got in life, you've got it. You've got God, you've got the infinite, you've got what all of life is meant, is searching to get, you've got it. Imagine the satisfaction and the bliss. And third one, Gyatavya Gyatataya, what is to be known in life, what people are searching for in life, in science, in art, in, in social political causes, that search is over, you have, you have known it now. Having known the Absolute, having got the Absolute, having attained the Absolute, you get this great bliss. Ananda Prapti, Tripti Prapti. So these are the stages in spiritual life. Let me repeat that mantra. You think it was a long journey. Actually it was not. It's as short as I could make it. <laughs> that mantra. Atmanam Chedvijaniyad Ayam Masmiti Purushaha Kimichan Kasya Kamaya Shariram Manusangjwarit Having known oneself as this Satchidananda, desiring what and for whose sake should I suffer along with the body? I pray to the Lord that may the blessings of the Lord descend upon us so that in this very life we can realize that and attain that great place. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu.